History is like science in many ways. It seeks to explain the truth, but must be open to new information. Sometimes what we think we know isn't true at all, and that's okay. The result is that we all get to be blown away when we discover that we've learned everything's wrong and be delighted or maybe horrified by the truth. It's not a perfect system, but it's just what we have. Number 10. Slaves as Immigrant Workers there are a lot of hot-button issues in America that will set people off. Typically, these are rooted in political beliefs, and for better or worse, they reflect how history is taught to children. Some would argue that such opinions should never color how history is taught. We need to learn the truth, whether we like what it has to say or not. And others will just make up stories and hope no one notices. For some years now, the history of racism and slavery has been perceived in a more and more inflammatory light. Just look at the news about critical race theory and you can see it's dividing people all across the spectrum. Back in 2015, publishers McGraw-Hill ran afoul of this when they chose some remarkably inappropriate words to describe slaves in America. Rather than simply using that term, slaves, the book labeled a caption and described them as immigrant workers. That's a prime example of using very sanitary language to give a wrong idea about something that happens. It would be like saying a stabbing victim was liberated of some of their excess body fluids. It would be bad to do so in a book that was being read by educated adults, but in one meant to teach children history, it's even more egregious. The publisher agreed that the caption was not appropriate and agreed to alter future versions of the text to reflect that slaves were forced into both migration and work. Number 9. Henry Morgan's Libel Suit History is technically happening every moment of every day. Though we often think about it as the distant past, the fact is anything becomes a part of history the moment it occurs. And that has, in the past, allowed for some unique revisions to history in real time, like when Henry Morgan sued a publisher for libel. Once called a pirate king, Henry Morgan was definitely a privateer and even the eponymous captain from Captain Morgan's Run. His exploits became the stuff of legends thanks to a book written by Alexander Excamillion, a former shipmate who essentially wrote a tell-all book about his time at sea with Morgan. Based on the book's story, Morgan was a scoundrel and a monster. The story accused him of murder, rape, and more. This was basically the template for everything we know about pirates in modern times, and as it happens, it was all false. Morgan was still alive when an English translation of the book was published, and he sued the publishers for libel. It was their first ever libel case in British history, and Morgan won. Future editions of the book were changed to remove the sensationalized and unproven accounts of Morgan's nefarious deeds. The publishers apologized, and he was awarded some money. Number 8. Supreme Court Creek Nation Ruling Many years ago, a good portion of Oklahoma was recognized as Muscogee Creek native land. Thanks to various treaties and sales, that land was parceled off and sold until the Muscogee population retained very little of their original land. That was until 2020, when the Supreme Court ruled that Congress never disestablished the boundaries of their territory, and that meant that about half of Oklahoma is still considered native land. The ruling is a jurisdictional one, which means that the Muscogee Creek Nation doesn't own the land. It's not as though we're kicking anybody out of Tulsa. But it does mean that it's under native jurisdiction, and that governs how laws apply to the native population. Crimes involving natives in that area are now federal matters or tribal matters, and not state matters. This impacts any future crimes committed on the land, and likely all past crimes as well. The land is now recognized as Muscogee lands, and the history books will reflect that it never technically left their control. Number 7. Viking Horns there's not a whole lot of Viking history taught in schools in North America these days, though we'll get to more on that in just a little bit. But when Vikings are covered, they're often shown to kids in illustrated form, complete with horned helmets and big bushy beards. That was the standard idea of a Viking for years, and it's still pervasive in pop culture today. After many years, the truth is finally, painfully, creeping into history classes around the globe. Vikings did not have horns on their helmets. It's a small detail, but it's also an oddly important one since it has shaped several generations generation's views of an entire culture. It would be like someone in another land learning that you and everyone you love wears top hats all the time. Because history books are often slow to update, there have even been occasions when history teachers have been forced to teach kids about Vikings using these erroneous depictions and incorporating into the lessons why the images are wrong. Number 6. Richard III was not a hunchback 
Thanks to William Shakespeare, most of the world knows King Richard III as a hunchback, but it was not just Shakespeare's fiction that painted him in this light. That was just how it got widespread. Numerous writers in the years after the end of Richard's reign described him in extremely unfavorable terms. The man was known as Crookback Richard. That description came from a schoolmaster after Richard's death who also suggested he should have been buried in a ditch like a dog. Thomas More and other writers exacerbated this image. When Shakespeare got a hold of the man, his reputation was utterly destroyed. Shakespeare's Richard is a vile man, and because he's based on the real man, history and fiction became inextricably linked. It seems like there would never be any definitive way to know the truth since the man himself died in 1485. Ironically, there are those who believed the stories were just slanderous lies. Richard was known to have been an active man and could never have had such a condition. But then we found his body. In 2012, Richard's remains were discovered under a parking lot. Analysis showed it was unlikely he had a limp or a deformed arm, or, as Shakespeare suggested, a hunchback. And rather than a hunchback, he appeared to have been afflicted with scoliosis. It only took several centuries, but the truth can now be taught. Number 5. The Discovery of North America we mentioned earlier that Viking history is one of those things that isn't taught very thoroughly, at least not in North America. These days, it's getting a little more traction thanks to revisions that we've had to make in the history of North America itself, namely that Christopher Columbus was not the first European to reach the continent. Evidence shows that Vikings made it to North America nearly 500 years before Columbus's journey. They set up camp in Newfoundland, Canada in the year 1021, according to an analysis of wood found at the settlement. It's only been in recent years that history books have finally begun to acknowledge the presence of Vikings in North America. The story is often a short one, as we don't have nearly as much information about their time here compared to Columbus, which is why so much of that story remains prevalent in the teachings. Number 4. Columbus and the Flat Earth Speaking of Columbus, one of the most famous stories about him and his historic voyage was entirely fabricated many years later, despite everyone knowing about it. Columbus did not believe the world was flat. No one did in 1492. However, the story was spread in much the same way Richard III's hunchback story was spread. A popular writer made it up and altered history. Columbus was looking for a passage to Asia, so it stands to reason that he had to know the world was round or, well, what the heck was he doing? His problem was assuming there was nothing Nothing else in between Europe and Asia. The man just underestimated the size of the planet. Washington Irving, the man behind the legend of Sleepy Hollow, was the one who retold the tale of Columbus's journey and thought that he could add some dramatic flair to it. It was over 300 years after Columbus sailed when Irving decided to add the detail that he was seeking to prove the roundness of the world. In his biography, it made Columbus a more heroic figure, standing up to the ignorance of the day by risking, in their minds, his very life by sailing towards certain doom. Because it was part of a famous biography by a renowned author, it became fact in the minds of most, and only in the last few decades of history books begun to revise the notion that Columbus, or anyone of his era, thought the world was flat when the Greeks had determined that it was round centuries earlier. Number 3. Dinosaurs were not cold-blooded the history of dinosaurs has changed many times as fossil records have been updated, but one of the most curious revisions to our understanding comes from what we know about the biology of dinosaurs as a whole. Once upon a time, people who discovered dinosaur bones thought they'd found the remains of a species of giants. It was only after finding complete skeletons that they realized these were not humans, but animals. And they were big, and they looked like lizards. So we decided that they were lizards. One of the most significant facts about lizards is that they're cold-blooded. That means they are ectothermic and rely on the environment to help regulate their body temperature. This is in contrast to mammals, which are endothermic or warm-blooded and which can regulate their temperature internally. The problem with this label for dinosaurs is that it's not true. Evidence began to emerge that many had feathers and evolved into modern birds and were probably warm-blooded, but then well, that turned out not to be true either. After some extensive research, it now seems that dinosaurs were not cold or warm-blooded. They were something in the middle. Dinosaurs were mesotherms. That puts them on the same playing field as things like mako sharks and some turtles. They can elevate their own body temperature by way of metabolic heat production, but they also can't maintain their body temperature. Number 2. The Truth of Thanksgiving 
There's a scene in 1993's Adams Family Values when Wednesday Adams is forced to participate in a Thanksgiving play and she goes off script detailing the atrocities of the pilgrims against the native population. It's a funny scene and it's also far more accurate than most tales of the first Thanksgiving. For years, schools published the idea of Thanksgiving being a warm and friendly melding of cultures. Native Americans introduced the pilgrims to things like turkey and corn and a big feast. Only in recent years has this notion been revised to settle on the ugly, uncomfortable truth. Some of the origin of Thanksgiving can be traced back to 1637, when hundreds of members of the Pequot tribe were slaughtered en masse and a feast was held afterwards. Other histories reference the Wabanoag people, who were supposedly the first tribe to celebrate Thanksgiving. But what much of this ignores is that history didn't start in North America when Europeans arrived. The native people had been having feasts for centuries, and the pilgrims were not even the first settlers that they met. The real truth of Thanksgiving is hidden among dozens of misconceptions, myths, and outright lies. Details were ignored and cherry-picked to the point that you'd be hard-pressed to point to the definitive origin of Thanksgiving in one place at one time. That said, at least now there's some attention being paid in history class to the nuances of what was going on beyond a friendly turkey dinner. Number 1. The Brontosaurus for a lot of kids, their love of dinosaurs was encapsulated by a handful of the giant creatures. The Triceratops with its three horns was very cool, the Tyrannosaurus Rex was powerful and exciting, and of course the Velociraptor, made famous by Jurassic Park, was the epitome of nature's ability to be terrifying. And for a long time, we had the Brontosaurus as well. A Brontosaurus was a behemoth, over 15 tons and over 70 feet long. It was a whale that walked on land, unrivaled in size and power. Until, that is, they told us it wasn't real. For years, it was a name given to the giant fossils that had been uncovered. But in 1903, someone noticed that the Brontosaurus and the Apatosaurus were not just similar dinosaurs, they were the same. The difference only existed because one skeleton was incomplete. Once they knew what they were dealing with, researchers realized that they were not separate species at all. The problem was the name and idea was ingrained at that point. Fred Flintstone was still eating Brontosaurus burgers decades later on the Flintstones, and it took many years for the name to finally be stricken from books to be replaced by the Apatosaurus. Fast forward to 2015, and they brought the Brontosaurus back. New research suggested that it was not a mistake to separate Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus, and that they were actually two different animals. After many years, it was a real thing again, and books changed once more to accommodate its reclassification as a real dinosaur. Some paleontologists are still on the fence and don't believe it's its own thing, but after all these many millions of years, we can afford to be patient and wait it out. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.